Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to us by our Amazon affiliate link. It's pretty simple how it works. All you do, go to wedgesidepodcast.com, click through the Amazon link, and buy what you were planning to buy through Amazon. We get a kickback, and that helps support the show. If you don't want to take the time to go to the website, you can also just look in the show notes, and the link is there as well. And if you want to be really awesome, just save that link as one of your favorites. And every time you need to go to Amazon, click through your favorite link. If you're looking for something to buy, I totally recommend Vegan Stoner Cookbook. It's 100 easy recipes that are so easy to make that even if you were high, you could make them. So you're saying I couldn't even fuck them up. Exactly. Sounds great to me. Well, you know, so many cookbooks out there like have a thousand different ingredients that you've never heard of and so i i always think it's great when a cookbook has just super easy vegan recipes because veganism isn't that hard top ramen and peanut butter exactly and sriracha exactly Mm. and a little dash of vinegar maybe a little bit of veginase yeah people throw that in yeah yeah (laughs) and corn chips i know it sounds weird but if you're stoned great you're adding way too many ingredients now. <laughs> but if, if you were stoned, it would be more like sprinkles and chocolate syrup. Yeah. You'd be like, man, that everything sounds great in this fridge. <laughs> <laughs> but please, if you're going to be buying something through Amazon, yeah, help us out. Use our link. Wishsidepodcast.com. We get a little, they get a little less. This is episode 143. Yeah, we had Sean Monson on. You might know Sean from a few films. Uh, most notably, Earthlings. He wrote and directed Earthlings. So, you know, if you have nightmares at night because of the footage on there, he's the guy you have to thank for that. <laughs> uh, Sean has a new film coming out called Unity, and we talk a little bit about that, so stay tuned. Yeah, it's basically the second set of uh, Earthlings. He plans on making a trilogy. We talk about that a little bit into the film. It's it's a really good film. The opening sequence is haunting, and it's not gory. You have to see it. Definitely. So stick tuned. We talk about it all. Stick tuned. Stick tuned. <laughs> hey, Jordan, what news events do we have going on? Well, this uh, past July 24th, uh, Nicole and Joseph were arrested and federally indicted for alleged conspiracy to violate the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. So definitely they need as much support as you can give right now. Um, they have a legal fund set up. And this is this is just days before the Amorites Conference. So it's a this is a new thing that they've been doing the last couple of years is right before the Amorites Conference is try to arrest activists happened again last year also. Mm-hmm. Yep. So um Please do what you can. We have the link to their legal defense fund. Um, yeah. For the slingshot this week, August 4th, 1919, 15,000 silk workers began a strike in New Jersey fighting for a 44 hour work week. 44 hours. It's, it's amazing that a lot of people don't really know the history of worker circle, especially in the United States where it's suppressed so much. But every little bit of workers' rights that we have was won by the blood, sweat, and tears of our grandfathers and mothers fighting in the streets for us. Just get out there and support your local workers. Support any way you possibly can. This shit matters. And as you can see, it has generational effects. But if you like these little tidbits of history, you can, I pull them out of my Slingshot personal organizer. I love it. You should get one. You can get one at a local info shop. Or if you don't have a local info shop, you can get one at an online info shop like AK Press. It sounds very addy, but it's not an ad. We just love them. Here in Utah recently, there was a local Joe Hill mural that was destroyed. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty cool Joe Hill memorial, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So, defend that. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode.
So how's how's your day going? Uh, it's going well. It's going well. Busy. Uh, busier than I expected as we get close. I kind of hoped I could cruise into this, but uh, because it's such an unusual release, we've just been uh, pretty busy leading up to the 12th. So what 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 is causing uh, it being so busy, being it a little bit unusual? Well, I think, um, you know, movies are released in so many different ways nowadays. Um, so you have movies out in theaters, as you know, that are also on iTunes at the same time. Uh, they're doing something unique with this, which is a one-day release, but a global release on about a thousand screens. Mm -hmm. Typically for a small independent film, you might have a, a very limited five-day release in just a couple of cities or one city. And then... Uh, uh, expand it, uh, what they call encore. If, if it, if it does any business, if people are interested, um, but they do a solid week, uh, but they may only do it in five theaters here. They're doing, you know, 500 theaters, but just for a day. So it's just, it's just different, different models, business models. You know? How, how is that, uh, super different than, uh, earthlings? Well, earthlings never had a theatrical distribution for, mm -hmm. for starters. Uh, we, screened it uh when we finished it joaquin and i showed it um to some distributors and and uh, they very graciously came up to us after and said that there's just no audience for this film and uh we should <laughs> we should sweep it under a rug which i thought was really bold to say yeah. <laughs> to filmmakers and narrators but um but it did find an audience. It just took it. Just, it just took a couple of years. It's what we call a movie having an afterlife, mm -hmm. where when, when you initially bring it out, no one seems to be interested, and then the same film, the same cut, the same everything seems to find a home out there and sort of grow. And even I didn't expect Earthlings to do that. Cause it's pretty tough, you know, ninety minutes to watch, but uh, it's 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 in about forty languages worldwide now. So you know. So, oh, I was just going to tell you. I, I can't tell you how many activists we talked to that cite that movie as either the inspiration for them either going vegan or becoming active or the tool that they use to give to other people to help them yeah. you know become mm -hmm. active you know it's funny because um uh, a lot of animal passionate animal activists that work for this organization or that they just want to you know raise awareness they're they're, they're sensitive to the suffering of animals they want to they just want to share that and hope that other people feel the same way and but usually, at least back then, they would always sort of tiptoe around it and try to find a real gentle way to talk about that stuff. They were always afraid to show anything really graphic. And so when I was doing Earthlings, I thought, you know, we sh it's a documentary film. It's a nonfiction film. We should, just, we should just show it. We should just totally just blast it out there, all of it. And, and that was why we couldn't get distribution at first. But ultimately, mm. that, that did seem to be more of a reality check for a documentary, I guess, than a sort of uh, homogenized one, you know? You know, it is definitely one of the films that when people ask me why I am vegan, it's a very easy way of saying, you know, this is why I'm vegan. But I have to admit, I've never been able to sit through the whole thing in one sitting. It's yeah. too much for me, honestly. No. Like, I, guess, I don't, I don't yeah. blame you for it. I mean, there were times when I was working on that movie because I was contacting all the groups and I was saying, hey, can you send me some footage? I'm, I'm putting this together. And, um, and then once Joaquin was on board and Moby was on board, I'd, I'd get more and more footage submitted. And I, there were times when I literally got a, a little box in the mail unmarked with a blank tape in it. This is between 1999 and 2005. Mm -hmm. So we, we were cutting on tape, I think, the first – footage I sent to Joaquin was literally on a VHS, you know, tape at the time when I was, which isn't that long ago, funnily enough, when you think about it, <laughs> but, um, and I would pop stuff into these different decks I had and just look at it and I just, um, weep, you know, at this editing station I had. I remember there's a scene, I don't know if you got that far in the movie, there's a scene where these guys, um, throw a dog away in the back of a, mm -hmm. of a garbage truck, um, which I believe came from Turkey and, that had come to us sort of just unmarked, you know, this blank tape that someone sent. And I just looked at it and I thought, oh, man, you're literally throwing life away. Like, I have to show this. Even if it's a rare, isolated case of abuse, I thought we have to show that. So that was tough to – that was a tough one to edit. In fact, you might find it interesting that we are in the process of doing a 
an updated version of that now. So we are, are sifting through all that horrible footage. Again, a new one. We've been collecting footage for about two years. It's all high definition, which makes it even harder to watch because it's not hidden by poor lighting or poor quality. But we've we've been gathering footage for about two years. It's it it it, it looks like Scorsese shot it, but it's awful. It's just terrible, awful stuff. And we're trying to find a way, a composition to put it into a composition that informs instead of. Um, it turns away, you know, mm. I was, I was actually going to ask. So now that it's been out a while, um, was there anything that you would want to change about it now? No, it's, um, uh, the environmental component wasn't touched on, uh, in that version. Um, and I think on the DVD, we had an extra 20, 25 minutes of stuff that we had cut together and it kind of expanded other areas. Um, but when we tested it, the first time I tested a two-hour version of Earthlings, the audience, then they just, they just feel like they're beat up. You know, they just they shut down. So we, you have to shorten it. This is another interesting point about editing, especially documentary editing where you're editing truth. And this happened on Unity as well, mm -hmm. where you are taking truth out of it because you have to consider the audience. You have to consider what, what, what they'll take. And it's a weird – I don't know if it's a moral thing, but when you're editing – a documentary and you're saying, no, no, that's too much. It's, it's radical truth, but why shouldn't we show the truth? Well, because you can't show the truth because it's too much. So it's that kind of thing that you kind of, that balance that you find while you're assembling a composition. This might make it sound like I'm a, I'm a horrible parent, but when my daughter was seven, she acts, asked to watch earthlings mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, you know, you don't, you don't have to. She's like, well, I want to know why, why we're vegan. Why do you do this? I I, I've heard you talk about this. So she actually sat down and watched it through and uh, through. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's okay. My daughter, who's now 13, um, she's seen it at that age as well. Um, and not by force. Sometimes she'd come into the office and stumble upon something and be alarmed. And other times, after years of working on it, she'd say, what is it? What, what, have, what Daddy, what have you been working on? And so, so you're not the only one that... <laughs> So well, good. Young parent, yeah. I actually, I've had some flack when people find that out. They're like, oh my God, you actually let her walk. I'm like, well, I'm not going to, it's the fucking truth. Like I'm not going to uh -huh. hide it from her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Our kids are fed by a lot of stuff, uh, you know, today, if you think about in terms of what we consume mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I'm not trying to sound moral about anything, but you know, I think, uh, you know, video games and, um, a lot of television just television is extremely violent and um and it gets more and more each year you know a little more is allowed where people sit if you think about it you go see horror films which are released you know almost every other week certainly monthly a new horror film is out and and that's nothing new hollywood has had this sort of perennial interest in horror for a long time which means humankind has had a perennial interest in in horror but it, it, to me it's an interesting psyche because you're like you're sitting in the dark and you're watching pain you're essentially watching pain and i think i used to see horror films but after making earthlings and then unity i had i had a hard time watching any type of romanticized violence in films even the the great directors like tarantino and these guys that are or scorsese even are really good at this at filming his movies, anytime I saw a slow motion reach for a gun, some low angle with music as the guy walks in, it just seemed uh, I didn't buy it anymore because I'd seen enough real violence and real suffering in the documentary space that romanticized or fantasized violence felt uh, hollow and and potentially destructive to me. So it lost any appeal. It kind of spoiled some movies for me in, hmm. a, in a strange way, making documentaries. I think like we had undercover investigators say like the same thing. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. we've talked to some like people who are inside the slaughterhouses, and yeah, they. But I wonder if that's kind of how why I, I've never really gotten to the the whole horror genre to begin with, because um, I mean I've been you know being desensitized by this stuff since I was like thirteen, mm -hmm. so. Well, some say, you know, I think some people like horror because it kind of, it gets kind of a, <laughs> you get kind of a juice from it, for lack of a better word, just some sort of juice that's released, you know, that fear that, uh, and I think some people feel alive, strangely, 
in that way. And it could be because of society or what they're going through and they're maybe sort of ground down a little and that thrill, just like extreme sports or whatever, somehow that juicing makes them feel um, alive, which is whatever it is. That's fine. Um, but it could be potentially destructive. And I find mm -hmm. it really ironic when we, when we release a documentary and we can't get distribution by a major company that, that does horror films all the time. Mm -hmm. I find that to be a glaring contradiction. I say, wait a second, hold on. You're releasing just horrible document. I mean, sorry, horror films, uh, with rapes and serial killers. And suddenly we're getting all this moral ground attitude about a documentary that shows actual, uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. Help me understand that a little bit, but that's what happened. Yeah. You know, like talking about, uh, just the brutality of a lot of the footage you deal with the, the opening scene of unity mm -hmm. is probably one of the most moving scenes I've seen in a very long time. And it's not even graphic, right? It, no it's, blood. Yeah. It's almost no blood. like what you don't see in it. Like it, it really took me aback and I, I it was just amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, that was – there's a couple of reasons why I opened with that. I got some pushback for that originally. They thought exhibitors were concerned about it. Even my my business partners making it, they're like, you should not open with this shot. You're going you're gonna to have people shutting it off in the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, they're just going to turn it right off and think it's an animal rights film, which it is not. It's mm -hmm. not just one, you know, one thing. Um, but uh, there's two reasons why I like, I like to open with that. Number one, it um, – we say this line in the film, it's a compassion that crosses species lines. So you watching suddenly feel what it must be like to be that cow waiting in that chute uh, for that door to open again and hearing those noises on the other side. So your compassion, even your fear, crosses species lines. It's not another human you're worried about. It's a completely different species that you are identifying with that i think is a healthy thing for an audience to experience number one number two it is sort of a passing of the baton from earthlings to unity because this is a sequel it is part of a trilogy so that is sort of a segue into um into the next documentary what what gave you the idea to create unity um, you know, usually, um, I think ideas for anything, a book, a movie, a painting, I don't know, a song might come from some sort of nagging inspiration that sort of shadows you a little bit. And, uh, with unity, it was more, uh, maybe philosophical. I don't know. I was, I just couldn't figure out why, uh, it just dawned on me that nothing we are going to invent is going to stop us from killing each other. That's sort of what hit me. In other words, you know, the wheel, writing, science, philosophy, religion, spirituality, technology, um, agriculture, architecture. I mean, all these incredible, wonderful things that humankind has developed and perfected in many ways. And still, we can't unshackle ourselves from literally killing each other like Neanderthals right out of the cave or the tree, you know. So... I thought, and I'm, maybe this was years ago because I've worked on Unity for years, but I was holding whatever the new iPhone was back then, and I thought, this isn't going to do it either. No matter how cool this thing is, this is not going to do it. It's going to have to be something that comes from within, some sort of inner shift, some sort of inner awakening. And that, I began exploring, well, what would do that? You know, And, and could that be presented to viewers in, a, in such a, a, a rational, logical straightforward way that it, it's almost like to deny it, you'd have to look at the sun and say it doesn't shine. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to present it in such a logical way. So that was the genesis of unity. You know, be dealing with being an activist for so long and dealing with these issues for so long, um, watching it, it really kind of reaffirmed and gave me that high level view of being in the trenches for so long. It, you know, it, it was almost like um, a breath, a breath of fresh air, like, mm. Oh Yeah. You know, there it's there's more to what we're fighting for than these these deep issues. It's it's a bigger global problem, and it all comes together. I, I don't I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, 
Exactly. No, exactly. And I listen, I love the great work that people do, the philanthropic work, the altruistic work that people are doing around the globe, whether it's helping the you know nature or, or, or animals or humanity or stopping a, I don't know, a dam from being built in the rainforest. I mean, you know, children who are stuck in institutions and, and can't be adopted. I mean, there's, these are worthy issues uh, and worthy of being in, in films. But also, you see a lot of groups like that are charitable organizations that seem to function as separate silos in a way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I thought, well, what if we went deeper than individual issues? What if we went just down to the core of every issue ever, ever, you know, which is essentially perceptions, the perceiving of opposites, separation based on form or pigment or belief or sexual orientation, or whatever, but all this separate stuff. And the whole thing became about we, how do we get beyond separate existence? Because the reason, you know, the reason I, I titled it Unity is the same reason I titled the, the previous film Earthlings, is, is because these are words that you cannot separate. In other words, the Queen of England and a tree are both Earthlings. You, you cannot distinguish the term. Mm-hmm. So it's it's good for the ego. It's healthy, you know, to come up with terms that encompasses everything. And yet we are had this propensity to have this separate existence all the time, constantly. And uh, so, so that became the focus. And then trying to, you know, maybe it would be better as a book than a film, but also a picture speaks a thousand words. So I thought let's let's find a way to to put it into. Uh, a film and see if it makes people think twice afterward. You know, if nothing else, that would be pretty good. How, how did you select that footage? And was there well, any footage that you wanted to use, but you couldn't use? Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, there was a, let me put it this way. There was a harder cut of unity that was done in 2012. <laughs> I finished this movie in the spring of 2012 and, uh, we showed it down at Marvel. Uh, in Manhattan Beach, it was the first time I, I showed that cut. It was mixed. It was color corrected. It was mastered. It was done. It was twenty minutes longer, and it was a it was just a, a harder cut of the film. And half the half my colleagues and the people that we showed it to got it, and the other half were it was too much. It took it too far. So my partners and I, my partners were saying to me, "Well, you can't have a movie called Unity that divides them right in half. That would be really weird." Um, and so began this this um, deconstruction process where we unpacked it, and uh, because you couldn't just take one thing out because it had this sort of ripple effect that would affect other things. So um, I didn't think it would take this long, but it did to reassemble it. Um, and yeah, I had to, I did have to pull out some things. One thing that was on the block, for lack of a better metaphor, was um, the opening shot to take it out, which I really really had to fight to keep, as I mentioned earlier, but. Mm-hmm. But later in the film, at the end of the body chapter, I had a sequence. I called it the death of birth scene. And it was it was so strong, even after having done Earthlings. I'd never seen anything like this before. And it was um well, I don't know, do you want me do you want me to describe it to you or should I just leave it at that and not tell you what it was? <laughs> I don't, I don't feel know. compelled. I am interested. I am so compelled. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh it was a scene from a slaughterhouse. Um somewhere in the world, but it, I had, I have to admit it was one of the cleanest slaughterhouses I'd ever seen. Um, it was not a Western slaughterhouse, but it was v- extremely white inside. And, um, it looked like the interior of the spaceship in 2001, a space odyssey. It looked really high tech and they brought a cow in and, uh, they cut her throat. And so you have this, this burst of red go across all this white. Um, she was the only one in this room. And the men were talking and sort of smoking and uh, and just kind of chuckling a little. And as this was just part of their work day, um, as she's dying, you know, they kind of pull her up by her back hoofs and uh, they cut her throat. And so you have this strange imagery, this strange stark imagery. It looked like it was shot on a cell phone. Um, so it also had that little bit of a grainy quality, high contrast grainy quality. And then they just begin to... Um, to sort of gut her while she, she hasn't died fully, but they begin to just open her up and take uh, all of her insides out, which is what they would do with any cow going through any factory farm and out plops this full grown calf right there on, on the floor. And it, this baby comes out and drops her on the ground and just starts 
mooing, starts calling to her mother and, uh, and to see that baby laying there and all that, those entrails calling out to its mother and its mother still alive, shaking. And the men sort of laughing as if nothing unusual was happening was to me such a startling, shocking, stunning image that I'm like, this. people have to see this because this happens more frequently than, than people realize because if you're drinking milk, as you know, I mean, this is for babies. And so they're killing a lot of female cows that are not producing fast enough or are dying or falling over or down. And this happens quite frequently. And so they just come over and they just cut the baby's throat. And uh, they both die there for a minute. And then they throw the baby down a hole. And um, I ended the body chapter with this, which is what I call the death of birth scene. And I had this narration through it. Um, and it just silenced the room. We showed this to about, uh, I think we did six test screenings with this one. And um, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, the people, it was too much, too much for them. And so that one, that sequence had to be pulled out. So, yeah. But damn. That sequence needs to be seen, though. It does need to be seen. You're right. And, uh, and it will. It's just that, I don't know, line upon line, maybe. You know, yeah. you, you crawl before you run. So we'll just, you know, this is why I always tell fellow activists, some who are quite frustrated or maybe angry and, and maybe understandably so, you know, uh, to have – uh, compassion first. You can't be angry at people for their ignorance. I guess you can you can yell at them if you want, but you know it's like getting mad at a at a junior high kid who's learning math or not knowing trigonometry. They're just not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. They have to be led to it. You know, you have to kind of inform, so teach, you know, or share, and then see. How you cast those seeds. Cast those seeds. They might land on stony ground. They might land on soft soil, rich soil, but keep casting the seeds, but there's no reason to get pissed off over it. You know? you know, it took me way too long, embarrassingly too long to fully realize that I would mm -hmm. say into my, my mid to late twenties even. Um, but all my like late teenage, early 20 years being an activist, I was just that pissed off activist all the time. <laughs> yeah. You're like, uh, uh, Harry Potter possessed by Voldemort or whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I know, I, I know the feeling. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's one of those things that I look at, like the the younger activists now. I'm just want to shake them and be like, just trust me. Just yeah, <laughs> yeah, it won't work. I mean, you know, it, it won't work. There are other ways to inspire change. You know, plus, in all fairness to other people, they come by it honestly. Mm -hmm. They've been fed that stuff since they were little kids. You know, those little bits of sausage and hot dog were put on their high chairs when they were little by possibly loving parents. Uh, I think Gerber makes a, a puree veal, you know, and um, so in a way they come by it honestly and it's something that they have to unlearn and I, it may be even akin to, you know, quitting smoking or, or quitting another habit that you've had. The brain has to sort of reformulate new synapses and so patience and compassion is without a doubt the best way to do it. I think. So, so what's the, what's your origin? What brought you to not just animal rights, but, and, and veganism, but what, what really brought you to where you're at now? Uh, um, you know, just, that's a loaded question. You know, I mean, it, just an interest in more, less impermanent, uh, you know, less impermanent things and more, in, in reality, more about reality. I mean, in a way, it's a sort of been a spiritual experience, but I'm not a religious person. But I just began to see this sort of, uh, this will sound philosophical, but anyway, it just, this transitory nature to everything. Mm -hmm. This transitory nature, this ex even this experiential nature of things so let's say you go to disneyland one day and you have a great day at disneyland and you ride all the rides and you just you just have the full disneyland experience and then you come home and you go to sleep and it's over and that's all it's ever going to be it's an experience and uh i began somehow seeing beyond mere experience that who i was or what i 
my be within was something beyond the experiential and beyond the transitory and even beyond time. And uh, I began wondering, who was I, you know, eight days before my conception, you know? So they're kind of spiritual thoughts. You begin thinking deeper, but it didn't seem that woo-woo or foo-foo stuff, you know, it seemed real because, look, we sleep a third of our lives. We, we don't really feel our bodies at that moment per se. We have these strange, obscure dreams where time and location shift and change. They don't really make sense. Uh, we don't form our bodies in the womb. They form themselves. We don't do it with our own will. We, we say that in the movie. We can't really control our thoughts. You know, half of us are trying to control our heads. So you really can't say, I'm a, I'm a mind and I'm a body. Because a lot of these things are functioning without our active participation, your heart beating, you know, your kidney, your liver, your spleen. I mean, they don't require your involvement. And I began to wonder about these questions. Inspiration is another one. Where does that come from? It's not something that's taught. Uh, it's not one of the five senses. You know, love, you know, falling in love doesn't seem to be one of the five senses. And that's another one, you know, the act of compassion. Uh, if, the, if, if the first law of biology is survival you know why does a mother dash into the street to save her child from an oncoming car i mean she's violating the, the laws of the universe if we are nothing but biological organisms and nothing more because survival would be all that mattered same with a soldier on the battlefield protecting a fellow soldier who may and he may be going into certain death if we are nothing more than biological organisms you know we would not do compassion would have no place in biology so what is this emotion of compassion? Where does it come from? And to me, it seemed to be spiritual without any religious um, teachings coming through. And um, that made me wonder about the world and life and this passing experiential transitory thing. Sorry, but that's a long answer to your question, but that's the answer. <laughs> no, I, it, it's, it's interesting because like your whole answer is what actually – I had very similar like contemplations. It's like what brought me out of like uh, hardcore religious teachings and more into uh, the person I am now, like just really contemplating all those different things. Right. Yeah. It's worth, it's worth contemplating as we age, you know, you just, you have to wonder. And I think it, in a way it's why religion has been in the world because people have thought about this and wondered and they've been a little bit frightened of, mm -hmm. of the great mystery it's why those, all those wonderful myths uh, started because they were just trying to point to something beyond just this transitory, physical, biological, uh, consuming experience that we are, these living, consuming things. Um, it's like a child that, you know, when they get scared at night, you know, they have a, a, a bad dream and you go in and you tell them a story and you comfort them. I suspect that religion was also, maybe in its inception, was intended to be a story to try to comfort us as we approach that, uh, that great unknown, that great mystery called death, which some might see as a black gate and some might see as a sun door. And um, that's how it started. And then, of course, it manipulated and became controlling and other, a bunch of other stuff happened as well. But there, I think truth and value can emerge from life on all its levels in some way, shape, or form. So we just look for that. You know, you, you talk about um, like the, the religions being like a form of comfort and not being a religious person, being an atheist myself. I, I always wonder if I'm depriving like my daughter of some form of comfort that, you know, uh, some of those religions kind of give you, especially, you know, in the face of like death. Right. Right. Well, you know, listen, 100 years from now, we're all going to be dead and there's going to be a whole new crop of people walking around. That's a fact, I think. That's pretty much a fact, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um so we won't be here, but most likely the earth will be, and um, another group of life forms will be here. This is interesting. This is an interesting question. Uh, go back uh, a few million years or more, and there was a time on this very same planet when a bunch, when we weren't here, and a whole bunch of other beings were. And uh, now those other beings are gone, let's say the dinosaurs, and and here we are, and it just makes you wonder about what this whole thing is about. And um, I think it's okay to wonder about that. Um, something in us is, is dreaming and feeling inspiration and falling in love, yet aging. And uh, these are honest questions, you know.
Well, I was going to ask you, it's a somewhat long question, but Unity reminded my wife of the Quatsi trilogy a little bit in the sense that it's a bunch of emotional clips from all over the world. Um, right. But of course, this one has narration, which is a big part of it. So yeah. um, how did you have the idea of having so many different narrators and how did they react when they were approached and when they saw the script and after the movie was finished? Well, I have seen those films, those three films, which I thought were marvelous. I saw them many, many years ago. And others that are similar, uh, Samsara most recently, was mm -hmm. I saw beautiful. Um, but I tend to like a lot of stuff. I tend to like seeing what other people are doing uh, without having any opinion about it or uh, preference how it should or shouldn't be. I tend to just behold it, you know, so I like to look at stuff that other people do. Um, with Unity, I, I definitely started with the text. I wrote all these feelings and thoughts and ideas down and then sort of fine-tuned them. Um, uh, the, the script passed through 45 different drafts, which is not a number I'm proud of. I don't think any studio would ever hire me to make a movie. I'm too slow and, and I go over it too many times. But uh, I thought if you're going to dump this on the audience, probably to get it as concise as possible. And then when I felt it was pretty pretty tight, it began as a mini series originally, a six part mini series. Each chapter was supposed to be an episode. Uh, there are five chapters now in the movie, but there were six originally. Um, the cosmic chapter was originally a prologue and an epilogue. I just I merged it into one. And not unlike uh, the Bill Moyers, Joseph Campbell, uh, Power of Myth series, which was, I think, uh, maybe a 10 part one or six or 10 part one done in the 80s. Or Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which was done, you know, also in the early 80s, a 10-part. I just thought we should really explore this. But we couldn't raise the money for a six-hour type of a project. And we could only raise enough for a 98-minute type of a project. So instead of uh, six episodes, 45-minute-plus episodes, they became five sort of 15-minute chapters. And uh, that's what a lot of the editing and the writing came down to. So then when I had that at a point that I liked, I, I thought uh, in the spirit of unity, it'd be refreshing to have more than one voice talk to the audience, um, maybe one voice for each chapter. And then I thought, well, you know, why do that? Maybe do three for each chapter or four, you know, just kind of mix it up. And it would be old and young and black and white, and gay and straight and so forth. Just kind of just a well-rounded variety of, of humanity. And, um, and then I thought that's, we, we should just get, uh, we should pick a number. It's an arbitrary number, but we should pick one. And the number was 25. I thought no one's ever done 25 narrators before. This would be really cool. Let's see if we can do it. And we started, I talked to Joaquin first cause I'd worked with him before and I, I got a few people interested. Dr. Dre was one of the first ones to agree to do it. Um, and, and I gave him two pages of dialogue to read two or three and, and we overshot it because we got 35 in the very beginning and I assembled a cut and I showed it to my colleagues and the strangest thing happened. I, I, we watched it and I thought, wow, it's not enough. Like 35 is not enough. Like these p voices shouldn't be recurring too much. They should kind of say a few things and pass on and someone else should come along. So I had a lot of editing still ahead of me and I was shortening it and I just kept, we kept going out for more and more. And once we got up to, I think, around the 80 or 85 mark, uh, which was just the, literally the beginning of last year, early 2014, I said, if we get any higher, we have to go to 100. But we never meant to go that high. And, um, and it, it just snowballed. They just People said yes. It, it would sort of come and go. We'd have these stints. We would record five people in a week, and then we'd have a lull for three weeks. And then some more would say yes. And some could do it, and they couldn't. Others we didn't expect offered to do it. And originally we thought we should try to find people that have demographics of all kinds that would help people to watch the movie. So, but then we just surrendered and said, whoever's saying yes and wants to be in unity are the ones that are supposed to be in unity. And so that's how we arrived at this, at this cast. I, I loved having so many different narrators. It was very, um, an eclectic mix of humanity and, and like, it just felt like that's exactly what you were trying to go for. Right. Um, yeah. And it, it also kept me really engaged with the changing of the voices. Mm -hmm. Like um, it really kept my attention and really held it through the whole thing. I thought it would work too. You know, I mean, we showed it to a couple of 
uh, let me see how to say this. We had, you know, like a couple big producers in the business take a look at it and they, I didn't have any subtitles up. We just let them listen and there was, they didn't like it. They thought this is confusing. Who are all these voices talking to me? Um, and, uh, one of my big investors was like, I don't know, Sean, maybe this is, this is really out there. No one's done this before. You already have a tough enough subject that you're trying to cover. Uh, maybe this isn't the time to experiment with multiple voices, you know, and we had a mixing issue. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, it took year, it took four years to record a hundred people. Well, you go to a hundred people's houses and try to record them and go through their agents. You know, it's a big, it's a, <laughs> it's a big job, you know, and then you bring it home and you sit there and listen to it. And, and just to, just to, just to divert for a moment on that, like when I would record people and then I'd bring them back, I was editing at home. I built a system at home and, uh, um, I would, I would always have them record what I call handles. So it, I, I'd have a, I'd have the lines I want them to say, or I need them to say, right? but I'd have them read a couple of sentences leading in a couple of sentences leading out, which someone else had already said, because I learned early that since they're all recording in separate places over time, different inflections, different intonations, different, uh, tempos. I needed the freedom when I got into edit to see, should Jennifer go first, Jeffrey second, Joaquin third, or should maybe Joaquin go first, Jennifer second, Jeffrey third. And so if it was in the same paragraph. So some of that stuff happened organically, really. Just listening to them and, and trying different scenarios in, in a couple of lines of dialogue. And, you know, there were technical problems. Sometimes there'd be a noise outside and I couldn't use the second half of that sentence, but the first half was really good. So then I would be taking different versions of the same sentence and stitching together. Um, you know, I mean, it was just an editing nightmare. And about halfway through, I thought this was a stupid idea. I can't <laughs> believe I painted myself in a corner on this. this is, I'm never going to get out of here. I'm going to be here forever. And half the people I'm trying to convince my colleagues don't even believe this is a good idea. <laughs> so, and then someone said, Hey, this is a no ego movie. What are you doing? Putting a bunch of movie stars in it, you know? And so I got that, I had to deal with that one as well. And I thought, well, when it comes to distribution and, and exhibitors, they probably won't even look at this if we don't have somebody in it that might interest people. Anyway, that's, that's what it took to put it together. But in answer to your question about the, the celebs, I mean, they were great. They, they, to, to all of their credit, none of them had a monitor to look at. They all sat and looked at their lines and they would say, so, you know, what's on screen while this is happening? And I'd describe it to them. And then they'd sit there and they just breathe life into those words. Uh, they're emotion enablers, number one, literally by profession, they're emotion enablers. And so, um, and they could work within those, they could act in a way within those uh, parameters. Um, and, and you can't tell when you hear it, like Liev Schreiber, who's, who's done a, who's a tremendous actor and done a, 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 a tremendous amount of narration. You know, I'd say, uh, Liev, can you give me a, a break here and then here and here on that line? And he'd be like, okay, it feels a little stilted, but if that's what you need, I'll give it to you. And then he'd just, he'd make it work. I mean, I, I, I edited these guys and I was in awe of all of them. Not only that, but also for them just being who they are, their whole lives behind them, whatever path that led them to this moment they're recording and all that in their voice, all that in their, in their sounds. It, it, it was the unity of it. It really was the unity of it, you know? Uh, it totally, totally made it the whole the whole film for me. Um, but it's funny you're talking about the editing because I was listening to it, thinking this is, must have been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I was actually wondering if you did what you were do you did, which you know record long you know um, parts and have it overlapping so you could pick and choose. I was actually curious about that listening yeah. to the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, some of them were some they were all great again in their different ways, but some of these guys were. Uh, they're so like when I sat down with Helen Mirren, for instance, you know, I was intimidated because I, I was thinking there for a minute. I'm actually directing Helen Mirren. This is kind of this, <laughs> this is kind of major. This is kind of huge, you know. And and I sat down with her, and uh, this is a, an actress who requires really no direction. She just naturally understands when she looks at it. Uh, she's like, I think you want it probably like this, and then she'd just say it. And the only direction someone like her required was probably to either slow down just a little or go a little faster, 
because she, again, didn't have a monitor and wasn't sure what was happening on screen or who came before us. So I'd say, can you just give me a breath here? And, but um, some of them I favored a little. I didn't mean to favor anybody in the spirit of unity, but some, when I put their voice in with the music that we were using and whatever images were on screen during that line, some voices married to the image and the music stronger than others. And I can't always explain why. It was just the way it worked. Um, some needed to be more straightforward at times. And so if the imagery and the context w or content was more straightforward, I wanted that. And some were soft, like Marion Cotillard, who, who was very soft. And so it would just, like magic, it, you know, lightning would strike. And you'd be like, oh, that's it. That's the marriage right there. So what was the, the reason behind not, them not having a monitor? Because um, I tried it, to be honest, on a couple and found it almost more, uh, not distracting, but it was something else for them to overcome, to come mm -hmm. over. They became, in a way, almost they'd become a viewer as opposed to a narrator and a part of it. So I felt it was better to have a, create, get, a, get them into a room when it was calm uh, and quiet and put the headphones on and put the microphone there and just have the text in front of, in front of them. That seemed to work best. Well, it turned out spectacular. It, I mean, it really did. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think so. I think so. As an experiment, I think it worked. Well, I mean, thank you for uh, you know taking so much time with us. I know, know you got to get running in just a minute. Um, but how can how can people actually view the film? Um, I know it's a it's a worldwide release, and then uh, beyond that, keep following all of your work. Well, there's um, you know they're going to release it on the twelfth. They're going to see how that goes, and then they have um, they have the they have encore screenings that they'll do. So it'll probably run for another. They have up to eight weeks, I believe, or more. So it'll be until almost November. And then um, there's a worldwide iTunes release in about 100 countries and maybe a dozen languages to start uh, in, the, in the late fall. And, um, and then it'll be out in the world. Yeah, it'll be out in the world. Well, perfect. Well, they, thank you so much. Oh, thank you both. That was uh, kind of you. I hope I, I gave you uh, some content to work with and uh, I hope it was interesting. No, it's Definitely. great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jordan. Jeremy, appreciate it. Have a yeah, good one. You have a great one. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> this week you heard Global Deceleration by Omega. Right now you're listening to Ripple Effect by Future Primitive. You know, this is the part of the show where I would say, hey, thanks to so-and-so for reviewing us on iTunes. But I can't because there wasn't a recent review on iTunes. So please go review us on iTunes and then I'll give you a shout out for reviewing us on iTunes. Just, you know, click through the links, give us a couple stars, say, hey, I love the show. Keep it up. Or say suck it i don't care just give us the stars please if you haven't yet liked us been our friend on social media you should do so we often talk about things that we don't talk about on the show and by often i mean every day this last week we were pretty much talking about the whole live stream of the greenpeace lockdown of the bridge stopping the arctic drilling ship from leaving portland which i had no idea was going on until after the fact i'm so out of it so check it out be our friend. And you would know those things are happening. Name just Christ, amen. Um, oh, wait, that's not the one we say. No, say. no. Um, uh, we have another very sacred, sacred saying. Hmm. I don't remember it, though. No. Fuck it, man. Shit. <laughs> Damn, this sucks. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to whichsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>